This is the Garden DC podcast, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 187 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Dr. Glenn Percival about mulching myths and facts. The plant profile is on flowering almonds, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events and this week's garden tasks in the What's New segment. We close out with the last word on a quirky egg hunt by Christy Page of Green Prince. This episode, we're joined by Dr. Glenn Percival, Senior Arboriculture Research Manager with Bartlett Tree Experts. Welcome, Glenn. Ah, thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Great to have you. So we're going to talk all about mulches or mulches and tree health and everything related to that. But before we get too much into that, we want to ask you about your background, starting way back with baby Glenn, and were you born with chlorophyll in your veins and a green thumb? Actually, I was. <laughs> <laughs> one of my, and I literally mean one of my very earliest memories of when I was a child was being in uh, the green, we call it greenhouse, glass house, uh, with my granddad. And I'll never forget him showing me uh, his tomatoes and his cucumbers and he used to have an absolutely beautiful garden. And I genuinely think that was kind of what always kick-started my, my, in essence, love affair with trees and, and plants in general. Wonderful. So you grew up with a gardening mentor, which is always a wonderful thing. Yes, yes. I mean, my, my granddad was great. And again, I apologize if I digress, but I'd just like to mention this. I'll never forget one of the things my granddad did when he was growing his tomatoes and he used to feed them a little bit of sugar. Now, this might sound very uh, strange, but he swore blind that by feeding them sugars gave you sweeter tomatoes. Now, about 25 years ago, I was working at the uh, university in Scotland, the University of Glasgow, and I remembered this. And I put in a research grant to look at the effect of sugar feeding on soils and plants in general. Hmm. And the reason why is, is when we feed plants, we, we give them nitrogen. But if we want to feed the soil, we need to give them carbon. And carbon is carbohydrates or sugars. And long story short, based on this very early memory, I got this huge research grant from the Scottish government to look at improving soils and the biology of soils by carbon rather than nitrogen feeding. And I published a whole swath of papers and had PhD students out of it. So, uh, yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, I thought I have to mention that. So thank you very much, Grandad, who is sadly not with us anymore. <laughs> Well, you have to share the results. So so what did your results say from that study? It was really quite fascinating. What we actually found that when you uh, apply sugars to, to, to trees or any plants in general, uh, particularly in, in times of, of when plants are under stress, they, they stop photosynthesizing. So they can't produce sugars and prolonged stress means they go into like this sugar starvation. So what we actually found is, is we, we could put during periods of intense stress sugar, uh, trees on a, a little bit of a life support. And, and this was actually quite important because in the United Kingdom, land is a premium we have uh, 65 million people, uh, basically, and a landmass the size of Oregon. And as a result, there's a lot of conflict between trees and buildings and construction. So sadly, malicious herbicide uh, poisoning of trees is, is rather relatively common. And what we hmm. did find is we, we could put these trees on life support by feeding them sugars. And we also found that actually sugars stimulated uh, a lot of mycorrhizal associations and, and root growth. So it was all quite fascinating. 
Wow. I think we're going to have to do a whole separate episode on sugars, <laughs> sugars in the soil. But let's get back to you a little bit. So you were uh, born with a green thumb. You had a great garden mentor. Then what brought you into the industry and your doctorate? work? It really started, uh, I did leave school at 16 and I worked with the local authorities as a apprentice gardener. And I'm talking in the 80s when they had some fantastic apprenticeships. So I, I did my whole uh, five years. I, I worked in a nursery. I worked with a fine turf team, etc. But the one I enjoyed the most was uh, the tree team. So I, I spent quite a lot of time working with trees. And then uh, sometimes things happen which are a little bit out of your control. And uh, we had a prime minister who came into power and her, her name was Margaret Thatcher. And she kind of changed the way a lot of local authorities worked. And I just felt it was time to leave. So I, I went to university. Uh, I did a degree in plant uh, biology and then my supervisor said, hey, you know, you, you really seem to have a flair for research. Uh, you really seem to enjoy it. Uh, I have a colleague of mine. He has a PhD studentship going in, uh, in Scotland, in Glasgow. Uh, would you be interested? So I said, wow, yes, definitely. You know, I love research. So I went uh, again, did my PhD in, in Scotland. And as my PhD was... Coming to an end, uh, uh, a lecturer's position applied for in arboriculture. So talk about being in the right place at the right time. So I applied for the position and I was awarded it. And then I worked for a few years in, uh, as I say, in Scotland. And then uh, it was, it will be 23 years ago on April the 2nd. And I always remember this when I was offered a position at Bartlett's. And the reason I remember it because it was April the 2nd, which is my birthday, 2001. So I started work for Bartlett's in April uh, the 2nd, 2001. And it was all to, in essence, build up a research laboratory in the United Kingdom, which I did at the University of Reading. And that over 22 years, uh, I, I, you know, we, we, it, we built up, we forged really great links links with the botanic the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew and uh, and so on and after 22 years of working at Bartlett UK I moved over to uh, Bartlett US where I am now here for the next three to five years working at our main research laboratory and uh, just on the peripheral edges of Charlotte. Hmm. And so you have a new home in Charlotte are you gardening there at all yet? Oh yes Yes. I, I mean, one of the things uh, my wife and I were really keen is that we had a big back garden. And uh, so obviously we bought a house with a big back garden and we started to, again, do all the landscaping. And we're also quite uh, fanatical uh, fruit and veg growers. So when we do grow plants, we we tend to earn more towards vegetables, you know, things things we can eat, things we can make chutneys and jams from. And for our international listeners, can you describe a little bit about Charlotte, North Carolina, where that's located and the growing conditions there? Uh, yeah, as we say, uh, I'm uh, kind of on the peripheral edges of North Carolina, just at the border between North and South. Uh, the growing conditions are great. It really is very seasonal. I mean, we do get a, a winter, not perhaps as cold as the United Kingdom, but certainly cold enough, we get a nice autumn. Uh, again, we're now hitting kind of the the spring, the weather's starting to warm up, the temperature's going into the uh, 70s. For example, at the uh, Bartlett Tree Research Laboratory where I do work, we have over 2,000 uh, different tree species and the magnolias are all in flower. Uh, the malice are just coming into flower. The cherries are in flower absolutely beautiful and then of course as the weather progresses round about may we will start to hit those 80s lower 90s so in terms of growing it's a really nice climate north carolina is so beautiful and we have so many listeners there and a lot of people looking to retire there i must say 
Oh, I don't blame them. I've only been here <laughs> one year and I'm absolutely, I mean, I genuinely love both. I mean, I do live in South Carolina, but I, I drive a mile and I cross the state line and I'm in North Carolina and it's just beautiful. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So let's turn to our topic of the episode and I pronounce it mulches and you pronounce it mulches. Uh, so let's talk about a definition of mulch and maybe some examples of them and how we use them in the garden. I mean, really, a, a mulch is a a layer of organic or inorganic matter that you put over the surface of the soil. And as I say, you can, in essence, use uh, any type of product as a mulch. As I say, wood chip mulch, uh, you can also buy a lot of these artificial type inorganic ones. They all have their advantages. Uh, You know, they have disadvantages. I mean, preferably for me, I I always like the the organic ones, ideally made from, uh, as I say, wood chip. You can get them, for example, made from leaves. Uh, You know, you just sometimes tend to find the leaf mulches, they decompose a little bit quicker than the wood chip ones either all they have incredible benefits on on plants i mean they they work they they have a fertilizing effect they work in terms of uh, weed suppression uh, they also suppress diseases as well not many people realize if you had a lot of root borne uh, diseases in the soil such as phytophthora or honey fungus, a good layer of wood chip mulch. It, it really builds up a, a lot of biological activity within the soil. And a lot of this biology acts as uh, like biological control agents. So uh, it also stimulates uh, root growth. So again, as I always like to say to, to my students or people when they uh, visit the research laboratories, if there really was just one thing you could do that will really hugely enhance the uh, the vitality, the health of your plants, it is to use a organic mulch. And what we tend to do with trees is, you know, I, I mean, the depth is quite critical. We normally go to, sorry about this, I, I work in uh, metric, which is mm-hmm. five to 10 centimetres, which is about mm-hmm. two to four inch depth. So we go to two to four inch depth. You really don't need to go any uh, deeper than that. And and if you are dealing with trees, ideally, we always try to go to the uh, edge of the canopy and a little bit beyond. Really, research has constantly found that the, the greater the area of uh, mulch you can apply to plants, really the far more beneficial effects it, it will actually have on the plant. And I know, for example, if we're dealing with trees, we, we do have clients who, in essence, have a love affair with, with grass or turf. And, and grass and turf, it... it I mean, trees can handle the competition, but it's certainly not good for them. So what we're trying to do is negotiate. And and if you find yourself in that situation, we always say, take the diameter of the tree and and ideally put a, a mulch layer three times the diameter of the tree. So if the trunk is half a, a metre, then ideally one and a half metre mulch layer all around the tree. And and I genuinely mean it when I say in many cases, you know, the life of the tree is won or lost depending on uh, how much of a mulch area you can give the tree, particularly with the research I do. I, I deal with trees in real, maybe perhaps more hardcore urban landscapes, towns and cities where stresses like uh, drought and heat waves are, are far more prominent, that's all. I think that's all fascinating, and especially talking about disease prevention, because that's definitely not something you would think of as a mulch benefit. Like I always think of it as either warming up the soil, maybe a little bit earlier in the season, or co- having it cooler, maybe in the summertime. And I'm particularly thinking around vegetables rather than trees, of course. And I do think about mulching around roses and tomatoes to suppress soil-borne mm-hmm. um, fungal, maybe diseases. But I never think about that for trees. So that's a great point. 
Well, it is interesting because the, the wood chip mulches work by a, a number of ways we're only just really beginning to realise. I mean, one, we do know, as, as I mentioned, they really stimulate biological activity within the soils. They they really enhance the, the good fungi and the good bacteria, and that in turn helps suppress a lot of, again, these diseases. They stimulate a lot of mycorrhizal association. But one of the areas of research we've been doing and Again, another question I like to ask is where do we derive a lot of our our pharmaceuticals, our, our medicines from? And obviously the answer is plants. And a classic example with trees is Taxacol. And that is a drug used to fight cancer. And it's derived from yew trees, Taxus baccata. So the area of research is... Uh, I, I use the term pure mulch, uh, but it's actually a single species mulch. So, for example, is a mulch made purely from oak better than a mulch made purely from beech, better than a mulch made purely from uh, cherry? And, and what we found is there really is quite a substantial difference between these types of mulches. And, and just to give you an example, uh, a mulch made from cherry or apple or pear, uh, obviously the fruit trees, are inherently very high in sugars. Hmm. And as I touched on earlier, when we use those as a wood chip mulch, uh, we get a, a, a leakage of sugars into the soil. And that is very good at stimulating root growth and mycorrhizal association. So if we find a situation where the tree has suffered from construction damage and had its root system severed, or if we're transplanting the tree and a lot of the root system is, is still in the nursery bed, then these types of mulches really, uh, again, give the tree a far greater chance of recovery, where other wood chip mulches uh, contain products we know have uh, antifungal, antibacterial properties, which are actually very good at suppressing diseases. So a wood chip mulch, uh, for example, from eucalyptus is very good at managing uh, honey fungus or phytophthora root rot. Mm -hmm. So this has opened up all new areas of, of research for us, looking at single species mulch. <laughs> very different, very geeky, very dorky. Yes, and I was going to say eucalyptus mulch also smells great. So, <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> so, for the normal home gardener, when we're buying a bagged mulch at a garden center or you know a home store or something, is that usually a single species mulch? And how do we know the sourcing of that and what it, what's in that bag? It's normally not. I mean, in many cases, it is derived from uh, pine, uh, I think it's pine or pine needles, which tend to be a, a little bit low in nutrients. I mean, my own experience with these uh, bought, you know, the ones you can buy from the garden centre is in one way they are fit for purpose. You will get some of the beneficial properties of a wood chip mulch. They will be good at suppressing weeds, for example. But at the same time, they won't be as good as, as say, one you made yourself in terms of like uh, fertilization. The, the garden wood chip mulches tend to be lower in nutrients. They're not really as, as good as like in, in terms of stimulating biological activity within the soil. I'm not saying don't use them. I mean, th they are good, you know, but they're not perhaps as good if you were to just you know, make one up yourself if you had like one of these little chippers in something like that. If you did lose a tree, you know, say a pear tree or something like that, then that might be something you could do. Or maybe you could contact an arborist friend and say, when you're taking down a cherry or something else specific, eucalyptus, I don't see too much the growing of, my, in my area, eucalyptus. <laughs> but <laughs> ask them to, to get that and deliver it to you. I mean, my own experience, and this is just based in the UK, most arborists have 
they don't know what to do with all that wood chip waste. I know in the United Kingdom, uh, we, we just used to have to take it to landfill. We just literally physically couldn't get rid of it. Some of our clients used to uh, take it. But as I say, in, in most cases, I'm sure any arborist would be more than happy to give you some wood chip mulch for, for free. I think there's a service called Chip Drop. Um, that you can register for. And so when an arborist is in your area, you can say, I am a place that you can drop those chips if you've taken down a tree nearby to me. But I don't think you get a choice of kind of tree. So, you know, it's probably going to be more your most prevalent in, in this area it would be oaks for me. I mean, as I say, any type of, 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 of mulch is good. But one of the things we are finding is fresh is better. There is this uh, misconception that you really need to, uh, you know, compost the mulch before you actually use it six months a year. Uh, really, that's been disproved now. Uh, you know, the latest research showing is, is the fresher, the better. That is really interesting. That's what I'd always heard that uh, you should age your mulch and that the fresh would have active um, disease or fungus in it. So that's really fascinating to learn. Again, I mean, when you read the scientific papers, you know, in theory, you you know, people say, oh, no, you know, you don't want to use uh, fresh uh, wood chip mulch because it'll have all the diseases that they go in the soil. But th- the scientific papers show that it rarely, if ever, happens. In theory, it should, but in reality, it doesn't. I mean, don't get me wrong. Maybe if you had something like our malaria or, you know, the honey fungus or maybe a wilt disease, then compost it. But in 90, 99% of cases, you know, the research has always shown using this fresh mulch does not lead to outbreaks of disease. And more importantly, all these kind of chemicals I I spoke about, all these sugars, all these other really good products that are in there are very quickly leached into the soil. And they have very beneficial, uh, you know, effects on trees and plants anyway. So that's, uh, as we say, why we we now err more towards the fresher the compost, the better the results. Sorry, the fresher the mulch, the better the results. And I think it's almost making sense because same thing with our nutrition, right? You want the fresher the the food, the better. Um, not something that sat on a shelf for six months. Yeah, that's that's actually a great point. I never thought of that analogy, but I will use that in my talks because, yeah, to me, that actually sums it up perfect. I mean, we want our food as fresh as possible. And it's it's the same with, with, with you know, with any type of mulch. Yeah. So that would be feeding the the trees roots, the mycorrhizae, uh, and all the other good stuff in the soil layer around the roots. Um, so I was going to ask, mostly what we use in the Washington, D.C. area is referred to as leaf grow, is the commercial variety, or it's just chopped up oak leaves and that sort of thing. Not as much of the bark chips. Those are usually used in pathways or something else. But it's interesting to hear that that's the preferential one to put around trees for tree health. Uh, but what about shrubs and perennials? What do you think of, of our mulches for those? Oh, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, it's one of the things I do in, in my garden. You know, whenever I put any uh, shrub, any uh, herbaceous perennial in, or I mean, you mentioned it with tomatoes, any type of vegetable where possible, I always try to apply and, and again, any type of, of of mulch is good. And you mentioned the leaves. And again, leaves do make a very good uh, mulch. Uh, it's just that they degrade quicker. That's all. So it, as they always say, it really depends on how much time you have. I mean, you apply a wood chip, uh, uh, a, a mulch made from wood chips, and it will last about two years. If you apply one with leaves, maybe about nine months. So as long as you can, you've got the time to replace it every nine months. No, I I, I would highly recommend it. And as I say, for, for for any type of plant, you will always get benefits. And that's a good point about the long lasting. So I've just written a book, Glenn, called Ground Cover Revolution. So mm-hmm. I am personally interested in green and living mulches. Um, so have you done any research about ground cover uses versus bark mulch? We have, uh, if that was the last 
area of research we did when I was in the United Kingdom, and we were dealing with a uh, we we call them industrial parks. They're like heavily manicured areas where businesses tend to have their headquarters, like I, I don't know Bayer or, or Canon or Honda places like that. Mm-hmm. And we did tend to find you know there's lots of trees there that were struggling with like low fertility and compaction. So we started to look at uh, these nitrogen fixing plants as a understory. And, uh, you know, clover was obviously uh, a very common one. And what we found, again, it's not my main area of research, but where we, uh, you know, did the understory of clover, you know, it fixed nitrogen from the atmosphere. And then, you know, when it died back in winter, it released it to the soil. We we used the term nature-based solutions. So we were starting to look at these green manures as like nature-based solutions, mm-hmm. uh, you know, under the tree canopy to, uh, again, just improve the fertility. And once you kind of get that, that ball rolling, you know, once those little, uh, you know, nodules from the clover release, the, the nitrogen and start to improve the soils. You then start to get the buildup of biological activity and, uh, and, and yeah, it, it's all very beneficial. So in, in fact, I actually wish, you know, more people would start to adopt that with trees. I think it has great potential, particularly in urban landscapes where trees do struggle a little bit more with stresses, you know, such as drought and salinity and, and heat waves. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Well, I would love to see more research in that realm. Um, What a little I've read so far says that tree boxes in particular, where there are uh, green or living mulch or ground cover around the base of a tree, uh, it does better. And that's because of watering indications. Like you look at the ground cover, it's starting to wilt or flag, then you tend to right. water water the ground cover plant and that waters the tree versus if it's just a tree, you're not going to water it. You're not paying attention to it. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. Just using the ground cover as like a biological indicator mm-hmm. when you need to, in essence, start improving your soils. Because again, as, as we always forget, I mean, literally 80, if not 90% of all problems with trees we see above ground such as you say, premature leaf drop, crown dieback, are caused by problems below ground. If you get the soils right, then you just don't see these problems manifest above ground. That's a great lesson, I think, for all of gardening, (laughs) that once you get the soil right. (laughs) Uh, Let's talk about some of those mulch questions, frequently asked questions that I get. So I'm going to pass them on to you, Glenn, and see if if you have strong opinions either way on these things, um, <laughs> how about dyed mulch? So a mulch that's uh, either a red or a black dye has been added to it. Is that a vegetable dye? Is that a chemical? Is that bad for the plant and the trees and soil? I think you get a whole range of these dyes. Personally, I'm not too sure why people add that. I don't think it's a good thing. I know the chemical dyes. I was recently talking to a a consultant who, again, had been brought in, and they'd used some of these dyes, which, again, chemical ones. They leached into the soil. The plants seemed to be struggling. Uh, I personally am not a big fan I don't think there's been that much research done actually in terms of trying to scientifically quantify if they are that detrimental. But my own experience is just based on observational is I personally wouldn't. I think it's completely cosmetic. The reason people choose it, they just yes, like to look at that darker, agreed. a yes. darker ground yeah. cover, especially when um, wood chips start to bleach, you know, kind of get that gray almost tiki look after uh, several months, then they want it to look fresh, right? Yeah, maybe from an aesthetics point of view, uh, it might. I mean, personally, it's not huge on my radar, if I'm being <laughs> honest. Uh, exactly. As I say, it, it's, yeah, I mean, if, if you want to, fine. As you say, I'd just be very careful on the type of dye you use. Make sure it is kind of vegetable-based, and I think you'll be okay, yeah. And then... The concept or practice of volcano mulching. Uh, That is very, very bad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It really is. 
very bad for trees. I mean, in some cases, and I remember we uh, we were called out to some sites where volcano mulching had been done, and we actually put a thermometer into the uh, right into the middle of the volcano mulch, and on a hot day, those temperatures were getting and. Again, apologies. I I work in uh, centigrade, but they were getting you know seventy, lower eighty centigrade, and water boils at a hundred. I mean, they Oof. were getting really hot, and we were seeing a lot of uh, bark scalding, bark burning. Uh, so, really, no, it's a <laughs> as we would say in in the UK, it's a dreadfully bad thing to do. And for those listeners not familiar with the phrase volcano mulching, that's when a a mulch is applied up the trunk of the tree or shrub or whatever plant you have and you're kind of forming a like a cone around the base of it versus forming say a donut or a depression. Yes, yeah, and that sums it up perfectly. Yes. Now I'm going to go on to the inorganic mulches that I get asked about. So a lot of people ask is it okay to do like uh, marble chips or how about those rubber mulches that are being used in say kid-friendly gardens? I mean, I can understand why they are used because they are low maintenance. And as I said before, they they will have some benefits. They they will suppress weeds. They will help stabilize the uh, soil temperature, but they really won't have any influences at all in terms of like fertilization. Uh, the other thing with some of these, uh, like these rubber kind of bits of rubber they use and these marble chips is mm-hmm. they can reduce the amount of gaseous exchange between the soil surface. And as I always like to emphasize, and, and to me, this is really a crucial point. We always forget that soil is a living, breathing organism. So when we kind of put these layers and, and in, in essence inhibit this gaseous exchange, this respiration, it's it's really not that good for them. So I personally, I I understand why people do them because you've got the long-term effects and the aesthetics. I mean, there is uh, some research coming out now, particularly with the rubber chips that maybe over time, as they kind of degrade a little bit, some of the products that leach into the soil can be detrimental to plants, but it does take a very, very long time for this to happen. I, I personally would always try and use an organic one if you can. You will always get better results. I mean, we've have research trials here at the Bartlett Laboratories where we've just shown the benefits on the soil are far better with organic over inorganic. Great points. Yeah, and I would say the next is a causing a little bit of controversy in my local gardening circles, which is the use of lasagna or layering um, with a bottom layer of cardboard. So you, uh, if you're not familiar with it, you start off with a cardboard or several layers of newspaper, and then you do a really thick layer of mulch. So it could be shredded hardwood or, you know, grass clippings or whatever you have on hand, you know, maybe four to six inches deep. And that sometimes is done on top of tree roots. And I worry, especially with the cardboard, about the effects on tree roots doing that type of layering. My advice is with the lasagna mulching, don't do it. I understand why people do it. (laughs) I do notice that, uh, you know, whenever I go in my neighborhood, everyone has Amazon boxes in front of the doorstep and you've got all that cardboard. And in theory, it, it sounds like a good idea. You could use it, you know, as a mulch, put the, you know, like you say, I mean, I've seen people put grass clippings, et cetera. But again, there's some research coming out now that this type of mulch really isn't good for the, the tree roots. Uh, particularly, there's a, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Linda Chalker-Scott, and she's got some nice information on one of her sites called the Garden Professors. And um, their latest research is showing that it's it's really not a a good a good thing to do. You know, try and av- avoid the cardboard. That's all. Yeah, that's my instinct as well. Is to if you're going to do it, 
try not to do it over tree roots, you know, do it in an open area, yes. yeah. um, maybe establishing, you know, a vegetable bed or you're establishing a ground cover area or a little mini meadow and then, you know, do newspaper, something that decays in a few yes. months yeah. in, instead yeah. of a thicker cardboard. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I I know again uh, in the UK, particularly, like, I'm going to refer back to my granddad. I know when he grew potatoes, he always used to line the furrows with newspaper. That would rot down quicker and help kind of suppress the weeds a little bit. But the card just takes a uh, uh, a lot longer, you know. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it has its uses, but but certainly I would avoid it with trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say newspaper is just wood pulp, basically with soy ink, you know, unless it's yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they're using color dyes for anything. But other than that, it's, it's pretty innocuous from, from what we know from newspaper printing. And so the next topic I wanted to turn to when talking about mulches includes soil compaction. So a lot of us in older neighborhoods um, and, you know, in older homes, you know, people have been walking on that tree root zone for decades. Uh, what can we do to aerate or get more oxygen into that soil? Just applying a, a wood chip mulch alone, or in fact, any type of, of mulch, leaf mulch, has been shown to be a, a a useful means of alleviating soil compaction. But obviously, it depends on the degree of soil compaction. If it's really, really uh, compact, then the, the wood chip, you know, any type of mulch on its own isn't really going to have a huge impact. But if it's like moderately compacted, and then you know, there are things you can do. Uh, and I know in the past we've looked at what we call vertical mulching, where maybe we will try and carefully take out cores of soil from around the roots and then just like, you know, fill in the, fill in the cores with some nice topsoil that's not as compact. So over time, it, it, it kind of, you know, just starts to, to break up the soil compaction in totality. Uh, believe it or not, one of the things we were doing in the UK is in situations like that, as, as well as a wood chip mulch, we also used to add worms to the soil because in uh, nature, uh, well, worms are nature's way of, of decompacting soils. So hmm. sometimes we're incorporating a little bit of organic matter if we can, because again, organic matter, organic, it's living, it's high in biological activity, that leaches into the soil. And again, if we can encourage biological activity in soil, that's really what alleviates the compaction, that's all. But again, uh, uh, using a mulch for compaction is always going to be beneficial. Great to hear. And and a lot easier than getting out like a core aerator, aerator machine ourselves. <laughs> Without that. a doubt. And I mean, it does work. So, sometimes, it, again, it just comes down to time. I mean, just applying a a, a mulch layer on its own will decompact the soil, but it just does it very slowly, that's all. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to kind of enhance it, speed it up, you could look at removing a few cores. What research are you working on now that's maybe not top secret that you can share with us? Yeah, well, <laughs> my biggest area of research is trying to dispel this myth that wood chip mulches lock up nitrogen and carbon, hmm. which they don't. <laughs> so there's a lot of negativity. But what we have found, if you incorporate those wood chips into the soil, then you can get carbon and nitrogen lock up. So, uh, we're, we're, so we're doing research uh, showing what happens when we uh, put the wood chips into the soil as against on the surface. We're also looking at a, a little bit more along the lines of these single species mulch. Uh, we're also looking at the different type of, is a, a coarser wood chip mulch better than a more finely ground up wood chip mulch? Because I, I know in the UK, uh, people have actually started looking at sawdust uh, as, you know, with all the sawdust that's generated from the, mm -hmm. the wood industry as a mulch. So really along that lines. And and what we're also trying to do is is focus more on the biological activity of 
of soils. And I'm not a molecular biologist by trade, but there's some great advancements in molecular biology now. And we are now uh, approaching that stage when whenever we treat the soil, we, we can now really start to quantify what's happening below ground, i.e., for example, is what we're doing, is it actually encouraging the buildup of the bad guys like the the root rot diseases, uh, the phytophoras, the, the the you know the rhizoctonias, the armor armillarias, or are we really encouraging the good guys, not just the mycorrhizae but the plant growth regulating bacteria? And we have reached that stage. So a lot of my research will now be focused on hey. When we do these types of mulch, whether it's the leaf mulch or wood chip mulch or, 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 or whatever, even these uh, inorganic ones, this is what we're causing below ground. This is where the, the shifts are starting to go. You know, so this is a good thing. This is a better thing and so forth. I know there's a lot of research being done for mycorrhizal relationships and figuring out you know, what plants go with what mycorrhizae? Are you doing a lot of that at Bartlett? I was doing a lot of that in the United Kingdom. I mm-hmm. haven't done as much. And I, again, no, that just summed it up perfectly because I, I know in many cases uh, you can buy in these artificial mycorrhizae mm-hmm. uh inoculants and what we were doing a little bit differently particularly with trees that were going into decline with compaction for example is if we had say a oak tree uh, that you know was struggling with soil compaction and going into decline we would incorporate a a little bit of soil that we would take from a well established oak woodland you know where maybe we had 200 to a thousand year old oak trees growing and I, I i use this term native soil and then we'd add a little bit of that soil to the compacted soil and then put the wood chip mulch on top and we were finding that was giving us some you know some really nice results rather than using some of these you know these these products you can you can buy in i think that's a really interesting technique to do that and find a healthy tree and borrow some of its mycorrhizae yes uh, in essence yeah, yeah that's what we would do yeah. yes hmm. yeah yeah because you know a lot of what i'm seeing commercially i just you know i feel like there's not that much proven in there that you know that mycorrhizae that's in that formula is going to match with the plant that i'm putting it on that sums it up perfectly i mean i think this is why when you buy in these inoculants they tend to be a cocktail of endo and ecto mycorrhizae and I think a friend of mine summed it up perfectly. He said, when you apply these products, it's a bit like playing roulette. You spin the wheel, you might get lucky. You might have the right inoculant in there for that right tree species. But most of the time, the odds are more against you than for you. That's all. Yeah. And if it's a little bit pricey, that's you're wasting your money, basically. Yes. Yeah. And I was going to ask if you uh, have any pet peeves about mulching or questions that you get asked about mulching or anything that you see gardeners doing out there that bothers you aside from the volcano mulching that we talked about earlier. No, as, as I say, I always try to encourage it any type of uh, organic mulch is going to be beneficial even if it's just a very thin layer it might not suppress the weeds as great but you're still going to get those benefits as i say my my two biggest issues were one the volcano mulch and this constant oh we don't apply a wood chip mulch because it locks up nitrogen mm-hmm. and and carbon but other than that no it, it it's great to see uh you know uh, I, I see it you know more and more people actually uh you know using mulches within their gardens, their landscape. I, as I always often try to say, if you can, just try and use a fresh one. It's a lot cheaper than going to the garden centres and you'll probably find the benefits overall will be better. Excellent. How can our listeners contact you to find out more? Oh, I'm very easy to contact. Uh, obviously, my name is, is Glyn Percival. Uh, I work for the, the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratory. Uh, if you just type in uh, those as search words on Google or even Bartlett Tree Research Laboratory, it will take you straight to our website and there is a, a little tab and it will say staff and you just click on that and my name will pop up and uh, just send me an email. It's, it's really very straightforward. 
great. And we'll include a link to your page under Bartlett Tree's website as well in our show notes. Lovely. Thank you very much. So for final thoughts on mulches and tree health, and we talked about fresh and we talked about not making it too thick, but not too thin. Would you have in the future some type of mulch sourcing that you would like every home gardener to be able to access or or what would you think would be what's coming in the future down the pike in a, maybe a garden center near you? I mean, I know at the moment uh, what a lot of people are doing is they're taking these uh, mulches and they're inoculating them with some of these biological control agents. I, I think they call them living mulches. Mm. So they the certain species of fungi, such as trachoderma, we know are very powerful biological control agents. So they're doing that, which might perhaps have some, you know, they've never really been scientifically tested, but there might be something there. For me, you know, I, I really feel this single species mulch, if it could be made potentially economically viable or, you know, we had the infrastructure in, I mean, the, the difference between the mulches in some cases was real night and day. I mean, you know, uh, and I, I have published a few articles and if people do contact me, I can send it to them just showing how, what powerful benefits these mulches can have depending on our, on our objectives. So if our objective is to reverse declining trees, then as I mentioned, these mulches made from fruit trees uh, are excellent. If we want to suppress diseases, the eucalyptus, or if even if we wanted to control diseases above ground, you know, like the apple scab, the leaf spots, uh, again, wood chip mulches made from uh, salix, the willow or populus, poplar, are really very good at doing that because the chemicals they produce when we ap apply the fresh mulch, it, it literally stimulates tree defense systems. So I, I really feel for the future, I, I, th <laughs> I think it was one of the Greek philosophers, could have been Socrates, who said all answers lie in nature. <laughs> I genuinely, we think he was right. And, and I think if we kind of keep pursuing this, I, I know it might not happen before I retire, but I like to hope that maybe I'll stimulate enough scientific and, and public interest that people really latch on to these single species mulches and, and, and maybe run with them in the future. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you again. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's, it's been a real pleasure. When you hear this, what do you feel? At IMAX, you'll feel transported by our unique sound system and crystal clear images. Like you're running across a desert planet or defending your city from a surprise invasion. With immersive IMAX sound and screens curved to show more, we take fans to the edge of their seats. Get tickets to Dune Part 2 now and experience it in IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. Flowering Almond Plant Profile Dwarf Flowering Almond, Prunus glandulosa, is a multi-stem shrub with beautiful light pink or white flowers in early spring. It can reach three to five feet wide and high. It prefers full to part sun and is tolerant of a range of soil types. It also does well in urban conditions. However, it cannot stand to sit in wet soils for long periods. Once established, it is quite drought tolerant. It's a rose relative and is native to Asia. Despite the common name of flowering almond, it does not produce almonds. That's a different tree entirely. Butterflies and other pollinators are attracted to the flowers. It's a larval host plant for the Eastern tiger swallowtail. Flowering almond is hardy to zones four to eight. It requires frequent pruning and do so right after it flowers. Take out any old wood, anything diseased, dead, or dying. It's easy to propagate from softwood cuttings in late spring or early summer. It can be a short-lived plant in the garden due to its susceptibility to diseases and insect issues, but it's worth growing for its decorative value and as a cut flower. This was a favorite shrub of Thomas Jefferson, who planted it extensively at Monticello.
Flowering almond, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, I think this is the earliest I have ever picked my asparagus. I'm seeing flower buds forming on my lilac shrubs and mid-season tulips look like they're about to come up and open up too. That is just crazy early for us in the springtime here in the Washington DC region. And uh, with our garden tip of the day, we've been sharing early spring blooming shrubs such as cornice moss so check that out on our facebook page on our twitter and at our washington gardener google group in local gardening events some that you might want to attend include the annual lar native plant symposium and native plant sale at the u.s national arboretum on saturday march 23rd I'm going to be speaking on preparing your garden for spring on Monday, April 8th, 6.30 p.m. And that's going to be a virtual talk for the Politics and Prose Bookstore. Uh, that is by registration only, and you'll need to go to politics-prose.com to sign up for that class. It will be recorded, so if you cannot attend it live, you'll be able to watch the recording later. And then from April 10th through 13th, the American Daffodil Society is holding their national convention here in our area. Um, for those who are in the Washington, D.C. region, that is going to be at the Hyatt Regency Dulles in Herndon, Virginia. And there are some hours that are open to the public and free to attend. And that includes when they are doing the competitions for horticulture, design, and photography. And that would be on Thursday, April 11th and Friday, April 12th. You can learn more about that at daffodilusa.org. And on Thursday, April 11th, the National Gallery of Art is hosting Flowers After Hours, and that's a floral extravaganza, and you can register for that at nga.gov. And finally, uh, the American Horticultural Society at River Farm is hosting their annual Spring Garden Market on Friday, April 12th, and Saturday, April 13th. That's in... Uh, Alexandria, Virginia. This is an outdoor event and includes flower vendors, seed and garden accessories, retailers, artists, authors, gardening experts, and food vendors and fun for the whole family that goes to support the society. It is $5 per person for walk-in or $20 per car. And if you are an AHS member, you uh, get free entry. And you can find out more about that, of course, at ahsgardening.org. Happy gardening! Get low-maintenance alternative salons with the new book, Ground Cover Revolution, by Kathy Jets. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer-resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30.
In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen, Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. This is The Last Word by Christy Page with Green Prince on a quirky twist on Easter egg hunts and how a tradition managed to evolve throughout the years. I'm an unabashed holiday enthusiast, and Easter is no exception. For me, it's a cherished time when family gathers and the weather finally beckons us outdoors. With a clan as expansive as mine, that is important since we do not all fit comfortably into a single house anymore. Ever since my daughters were little, we would have an Easter egg hunt every year on Easter Sunday. When their preteen years arrived, they were ready to give up the hunt, but I was not. I just wasn't ready to let go of the tradition just yet. So I decided to inject a little excitement, riddles and clues. Those were the stars of our new annual egg hunt. That first year, I'm not sure if I even knew what I was getting myself into. I just thought it'd be a lot of fun. I spent a couple of weeks thinking up clues, planning where the eggs would be hidden, and mapping it all out. Each plastic egg that they found had a clue to help them find their next egg. The grand finale? Well, the last egg, which revealed the location of their Easter present. I started fairly fairly small that year with just five or six clues that led them around the house. It was so much fun. Some clues they guessed rather quickly, while others, they needed a little help. We had revitalized the egg hunt and all were happy. The following year, my ambitions grew. The eggs were hidden in the house and in the yard. There were eight or nine clues while being careful not to repeat any of the hiding spots from the year before. The kids may have rolled their eyes, but they didn't stop until each clue was solved. By the third year, we decided to take our hunt beyond the confines of our property and into the neighborhood. This unleashed a plethora of creative clue possibilities. The tradition just kept evolving. In one memorable year, we replaced eggs with selfies. I'd text a clue, they'd rush to the specified location, snap a selfie, and send it to me for the next clue. It was a modern twist that added a new layer of excitement. Word got around, and soon, friends and neighbors wanted in on the fun. They became helpful clue bearers. My daughters would have a clue that would lead them to this person's house where they would wish them a happy Easter and collect their next egg. The fun just expanded when my oldest daughter got her license. Now I didn't have a limit to where my clues would be hidden. They no longer needed to be within walking distance. I could go anywhere. I was hiding eggs in the park, the ball field, the ice cream shop, and any other place I could think of. The Easter egg hunt had become a full-fledged adventure. Fast forward to today, and my daughters are now 24 and 22, and they still eagerly anticipate these hunts. Sometimes, they even invite friends to join the escapade. Every year, when I'm trying to think of new clues, or wondering when I'm going to have time to create and hide these clues, I think about the disappointment I felt when they were preteens and ready to stop. I pause and remember that a few hours of planning yields years of treasured memories. So with pen and paper in hand, I eagerly start plotting new hiding spots. This has been the last word from Christy Page with GreenPrints.com. This episode is brought to you by Paramount+. Plus. Ewan McGregor stars as Count Alexander Rostov in A Gentleman in Moscow, the new limited series based on the best-selling novel. Stream it on March 29th with the Paramount Plus with Showtime plan. Visit ParamountPlus.com to try it free.
Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash garden DC. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.blogspot.com. Thank you. You can find and follow Washington Gardener on Twitter slash X, Instagram and Pinterest at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook at Washington Gardener Magazine. Please take a moment to rate and review this podcast on Spotify and Apple. Open the Spotify or Apple app, search for Garden DC, check on the rate button, and select five stars.